Well, aloha everyone and welcome back to Human Nutrition here at Chaminade University. Today we, we will be discussing water and its role in many of life's metabolic processes. So we'll start off by explaining why water is so essential to life and we'll do that by describing the multiple processes that water is involved in and we'll talk about the multiple processes that maintain the water balance within the body. And we'll talk about the roles of water in terms of sodium hormones and enzymes and how they play a role in the development of hypertension or high blood pressure. We'll talk about the recommended amount of water that you're supposed to intake daily. We'll talk about the effects of diuretics, which would be something that is going to um, allow water to be leaving the body at a higher level than normal, things like caffeine or alcohol, and then how that affects the balance of the body's water. And then we'll differentiate between dehydration and water intoxication, which are two extremes, right? Too little water or far too much water. And we'll talk about the symptoms related to each of those. But let me just start off by saying that water is the most abundant substance in the human body. We are approximately 45 to 75% water on any given day. And that distribution can vary depending on many things, including your age. As we get older, the percent of water in our body declines. Our gender, uh, males have more body water than um, female. And that's because it has to do with the composition of fat and muscle. So muscle is going to be much more water, approximately 65% more water than fat. And as we get older, we're going to be having muscle attrition, right? And men are typically going to have more uh, body muscle and females are going to have a little bit more body fat. So that's why we're going to have a range in the amount of percentage of water in our bodies. Either way, it's a pretty good chunk of our body that's going to have water in it at any given moment. So we're going to be using that water for a lot of different things. As I mentioned, um, males are going to have a little bit more water than women because we're a little bit more uh, body muscle than body fat. But overall, we are approximately 50 to 70 something percent water. Here we have 20 percent fat in the male and 29 percent fat in the female. Again, fat's going to have a little bit less water in it than muscle does. And muscle's going to have a little bit more protein, right? Um, so let's talk about water itself. Water is what's called a polar molecule, and polar means that it has a um, although it has a neutral electrical charge overall, it has partial positive charges on some parts of the molecule and partial negative charges on other parts of the molecule. And that's because of the relative size between oxygen and hydrogen. So I like to say something here that these guys are sharing an electron. That's how these bonds work, right? So an electron is going to be rotating around the smaller hydrogen and then around the larger oxygen. And then same here, it's going to be rotating around the smaller hydrogen and then the larger oxygen and the smaller hydrogen. And this is akin to sharing a lawnmower with a neighbor who has a much larger lawn than you. Although both of you are going to have your lawns mowed, the neighbor with the larger lawn is going to use the lawnmower for a longer period of time. Right? It's just the way that it works. And that means that that negative electron spending more time orbiting this oxygen molecule is going to confer a partial negative charge to this part of the molecule, whereas the partial positive charges will be conferred to the hydrogen ends of this molecule. Now water is going to be very important in maintaining acid-base balance, and that's going to actually happen because of the fact that it can split into um, this water molecule that you see here and into an OH and an H separately. And we'll talk about that in a minute. Now, solvent would be any liquid in which a substance dissolves. And water is the universal substance in that most liquid or most substances are going to dissolve in universal um, in water. And that's because of the polarity of the water molecule. Remember, we have some partial positive charges and some partial negative charges. And so that's going to help dissolve anything like proteins, sugars, other minerals, etc., because it's going to allow for the negative charges and the positive charges of the molecule to get pulled apart by the polarity of the water. That's also going to allow water to help transport these dissolved nutrients and other substances throughout the body. So all of the liquid in the body is going to be aqueous solution, our blood, our interstitial fluid, our cytosol inside our cells. All of that is an aqueous solution, meaning that it's water-based. And that allows us to transport things like oxygens and nutrients to the cell, hormones to the cell, and then things away from the cell as well, like waste products, which are going to be excreted in our urine and our stool in the long run. But this is what I mean when I say that it helps break up positive and negative charges. So here are... Um, a really nice ionic bond here between sodium and chloride. You can see it's a beautiful crystal structure. We're going to have um, sodium and green chloride, so chloride, sodium, chloride, sodium, chloride, and that's going to allow us to make this nice table salt crystalline structure. But water, being a more promiscuous molecule, 
if you were to say that the sodium and chloride were in, say, a monogamous relationship, right, this water is a little bit of a promiscuous molecule, and it's going to be able to surround if they were, say, these were dance partners on a floor, one positive and one negative. A bunch of these partial negative charges from the oxygen molecule can surround the positive charge of the sodium ion and separate it away from its dance partner on the floor. So chloride can also have that same thing happen because it's been pulled away from sodium and is surrounded by all the partial positive charges of these hydrogen ions. And so in this way, sodium chloride is going to dissolve in water because it's going to have all of its charge needs met by these partial positive and partial negative charges of the water molecules. All right, water is going to be very fantastic at maintaining our body temperature. It's really good at absorbing heat and releasing heat. Um, so it can take heat from parts of the body and extend it out, say, to your fingertips by way of the bloodstream. So it's going to allow heat to travel throughout the body as well. It also serves as a lubricant for your joints and your eye tissues. Um, so, for example, when you create tears, those are aqueous solutions. In your mouth, all that saliva is an aqueous solution and all of the intestinal juices, etc. So it provides a nice lubricant for things to move about within the body and a protective cushion for your internal organs, for example, or for a fetus during pregnancy, which would be surrounded by amniotic fluid, again, another aqueous solution. Additionally, it helps provide structure to the cells. So it's going to allow the cells to make their three-dimensional shapes. This is talking about water um, as a regulation of body temperature. So your heart, heart and other processes are going to be creating a lot of core heat here, which is then going to get spread out to your limbs via the blood supply, right? The capillaries are going to be delivering not just oxygen, but also heat to those cells, right? And then as we heat up, eventually we're going to end up creating sweat out of our sweat glands through our sweat pores. All right, water is also going to be, play a huge function in metabolism. And during metabolism, we are constantly undergoing the process of building things and breaking things down. And the process of building things is called anabolism. If you think of anabolic steroids, pump you up, right? And catabolic is going to be the process of breaking things down. Picture the cats like to knock things off of tables. And all of the anabolic and catabolic reactions in your body are the sum of all of those are going to be considered metabolism. And water is responsible for a lot of these reactions. Almost all of these reactions are either hydrolysis or condensation reactions. What do I mean by that? When we are putting things together, we're going to have a condensation reaction occurring whereby we're going to take off the ends of each of the molecules, one hydrogen from one side and one OH from the other side, creating a water molecule and also creating kind of a sticky end whereby those two molecules can bind to each other. And when we are breaking down molecules, we want to um, cap off those sticky ends. Again, one side is going to get an H and one is going to get an OH, and that's going to happen during the process of hydrolysis or breaking water molecules in half. So when we are breaking things down during digestion, water is also going to be hydrolyzed or broken in half, allowing us to break down the bonds in carbohydrate molecules, protein molecules, and fat molecules. And again, as I mentioned, when smaller molecules join together, that's a dehydration synthesis reaction or a condensation reaction, which is going to create water. Additionally, water plays a great role in acid-base balance because it's able to break down into that H and OH, and as you may know, the ratio of the H and the OH groups is going to be what determines pH. And so we can use those H groups and, P and OH groups to be combined in order to create carbonic acid, which is going to be a buffer that's in our bloodstream. All right, so water is going to have to have a specific homeostatic conditions, right? Fluid balance. We need to maintain homeostasis of all sorts of things, including the concentration of water within our blood supply, within our um, intracellular fluid, within our cytoplasmic fluid. We need this fluid in order to be able to have normal reactions happen within the cells. And the body is constantly going to be adapting to the changes in water intake and losses by creating thirst, for example, so you bring more in or excreting more water. But the, the goal is to make sure that you're in water balance, which means that your amount of water that you're consuming is equal to the amount of water that you're excreting. And when I say water consuming, it's not all going to be in liquid form, although that is what you think of when you think, oh, I'm supposed to drink a gallon of water a day, right? Or 1,500 milliliters comes from beverages, but some of it's going to come from food, right? The food that you eat is not entirely devoid of water unless you're eating astronaut food. Um, and then a good bit of it is also 300 milliliters or so is coming from me that metabolic water that we talked about 
from those condensation reactions. All of that's going to be considered water intake. Additionally, we're going to have water output, and water leaves our body in several different ways, mainly from the urine, but also from sweat, the stool, and the silent loss, which is from our breath, right? When you're going to breathe on a window, you can see your breath sometimes on the glass. That's because you're actually expiring water molecules as well when you're going through the process of gas exchange. So just the process of breathing will make you lose approximately 350 milliliters of water a day. All right, so where do we get our water from? Again, beverages are going to be the main source, but also we're going to get it from our food. Fruits and vegetables are obviously going to contain the most water, um, and grains are going to be more dehydrated. Things are going to contain the least water. Um, but we use water during metabolism as well, and water is going to be generated during met metabolism. Again, we call that metabolic water. In between these two, we're going to have about two quarts of water daily. So I'm sorry, between these three, beverages, food, and your metabolic water. Now, how do we lose water? Now, we lose water through the kidneys. Again, this is urine. And we call this sensible water loss. And is and I don't mean sensible as in nonsensical. I mean sensible as in you're able to sense that you are losing that water, right? You know when you urinate that you are losing that amount of water. Um, but we also have what we call insensible water loss down here, which would be water that's evaporated while you ex exhale or while you sweat. That might be the amount of water that you're not necessarily sure that you're losing. You're unable to sense it. Um, we're also losing water through intestinal fluids in the stool, although the main function of those small intestines is to pull as much water as possible back into the, um, the body. We do still lose some of it throughout the stool, and sometimes we can lose more or less depending on what we are eating. If we're eating plant fibers, we can reduce the amount that's excreted, um, or if we're a sick, for example, and we're undergoing the process of diarrhea or vomiting, that can obviously increase the excretion of water from the body. Okay, so we can excrete water through sweat, and this is going to vary based on multiple environmental factors, including the outside temperature, obviously, um, the humidity, the wind, sun's intensity, the amount of clothing that you're wearing, and how much physical activity the individual is undergoing. As I mentioned, we have water in multiple different fluid compartments in our body. We have body fluid located in our intracellular fluid and our extracellular fluid, so the intracellular fluid would be um, within the cells, like the cytoplasm, containing things like potassium, proteins, various acids, etc. But we also have extracellular fluid, um, including things, it's going to also have a lot of the same things, so it's also going to have sodium chloride, sodium bicarbonate solutions, etc. And the concentration of these different solutes in solution is going to be what drives these different gradients, it's going to be what drives the pickup of these nutrients by the cell or the excretion of those wastes by the cell into the extracellular fluid. Um, in terms of extracellular fluid, we have two main types. We have that interstitial fluid, which is the fluid that bathes the outside of the cells, and we have the intravascular fluid, namely the blood and also the lymphatic fluid. And the fluid's constantly going to be moving between the extracellular fluids and the intracellular fluids, right? So we're constantly going to have uh, an interface between the blood and the interstitial fluid and the interstitial fluid and the intracellular fluid. Okay, so this is basically what I'm showing you previously, that we have the extracellular fluid compartments are going to include the vascular fluid, which is the blood, obviously not including the blood cells, right, just the fluid that surrounds them. The interstitial fluid, which is what's going to bathe the cells, and again, there's always going to be crosstalk between these two, so we're going to be losing things from the intravascular fluid into the interstitial fluid and vice versa, and then from the interstitial fluid, that'll be delivering nutrients into the cell, and then the waste will coming across the cell into the interstitial fluid into the vascular fluid for excretion. So that's the difference between the intracellular fluid compartments and the extracellular fluid compartments. Okay, so we also have specialty types of minerals that are called electrolytes, and these are going to be very uh, play a very large role in fluid balance. Things like potassium, phosphate, magnesium, calcium, chloride, sodium, anything that you see a positive or a negative charge after them. And anything that is a positive charge, that's called a cation, and anything that's an anion is a negative charge, right? Anti or anion negative charge. And these electrolytes are going to be responsible for maintaining water balance between the multiple compartments of the body. And sodium is one of the ones that has the greatest effect on fluid balance. Basically, if sodium goes, water will follow. 
Um, and it follows by the process of osmosis. So osmosis is basically going to be the rate of diffusion of water specifically from one side of the membrane to the other. So the water and the solvent can move between the semipermeable mem membrane from one side to the other. The solutes, remember, do not. And water is going to be constantly moving from a diluted concentration of water to a high concentration, I'm sorry, diluted concentration of electrolytes to a high concentration of electrolytes. And if you flip this around, it makes sense. So if you picture that a diluted concentration of electrolytes would be a high concentration of water. So if, for example, you had 5% of your electrolytes, which is very high, but let's say we had 5% versus 1%. Right, so 5% electrolytes would be 95% water, 1% electrolytes would be 99% water. So water would fly, flow from the 99% water to the 95% water. And that means that it would be flowing from a diluted concentration of electrolytes to a high concentration of electrolytes. Um, and this is going to control the directional flow of water. That's called osmotic pressure or the change in the concentration of water which is always depicted as the concentration of particles in solution. So you have to keep that in mind, that we're actually going to be going from high concentration of water to low concentration of water, but it's always going to be depicted as the concentration of salts or whatever in fluid. So you're going to have to flip it to be whatever the opposite of that is. So 5 becomes 95, 1 becomes 99, and then it makes a lot of sense. And that's going to be the direction of water, from high concentration of water to low concentration of water. And that's called osmotic pressure or the osmotic pull from one side of the membrane to the other, the ability of that membrane that side of the membrane to draw water across it. What do I mean by that? So osmosis is when water is going to be moving into or out of the cell. On the right, the amount of concentration of solutes is the same on the outside as the inside. So while we're going to have things water flowing in and out, it's going to be even in terms of net flow. On this side, however, here's where we're, we've apparently just started, is when we're going to be having a lower concentration of solutes on the inside of this cell. That means that we have a higher concentration of water, okay? So help keep that in mind. On the outside, we have a higher concentration of solutes. That means we have a lower concentration of water. And water is always going to flow from the highest concentration of water to the lowest concentration of water. That means the water here is going to be moving out. That means that this cell in a hypertonic solution is going to purge all of its fluids until it reaches equilibrium, right? Now, if that, let me, uh, let me make something clear here. If there is um, nothing but pure water on this side, all of the water will continuously go across because it will never reach equilibrium. This will continue until we reach equilibrium with the same concentration of solutes on the inside and the outside of the cell. So how do we use this inside the body? So we want to create an, a gradient. We create several gradients. We create all these electrochemical gradients based on sodium concentration, potassium concentration, calcium concentration, etc. So in order to maintain these normal electrolyte concentrations, we're going to use the sodium potassium pump. As I mentioned, water is going to move towards sodium. So if we have a high concentration of sodium on one side of the membrane, water is going to follow. And by using the sodium potassium pump, we can keep the sodium concentration gradient going, by keep, but still keeping the concentration of positive and negative ions the same. So we're going to be exchanging three sodium ions for two potassium ions. So we're still going to be exchanging positive for positive, but we're going to end up with a lot more sodium on one side, which is going to allow water to go from one side to the other. This is going to keep the cell from swelling and bursting. So we want to make sure that we're keeping the cell within the normal appropriate water concentrations. Additionally, this is going to help aid in electrical conductivity and especially in the nervous system and in muscle cells, which is very important, right? All of this runs on an electrochemical gradient, and so if we're able to keep this gradient alive, then we can have this electrical conductivity in the specialized cells. Additionally, it helps us aid in nutrient absorb absorption by keeping our gradient such that the nutrients are flowing in, and it's, we have specialty proteins such as albumin that help regulate this fluid balance. So if we have albumin in the vascular space, which is inside the vasculature, that's going to help attract fluid from the interstitial spaces, which means we're going to be getting that waste fluid back into the blood supply to be able to excrete it. This is what the sodium potassium pump looks like. The objective of the sodium potassium pump is to maintain a sodium gradient such that we have more sodium on the outside of the cell than inside the cell. And this becomes important later on when we talk about symporters because sodium, when it comes back into the cell, oftentimes will bring something along with it, like glucose. Um, and so this will allow us to bring nutrients into the cell while still maintaining an electrical, um, approximate electrical, so we're going to be exchanging three sodium for two potassium. So we're also going to be making a, an electrical gradient as well. 
Um, okay, so three sodiums are going to bind to the inside of this specialty pump along with an ATP molecule, right? Triphosphate, one, two, three. That ATP molecule is going to get cleaved into ADP, diphosphate, one, two, and that free phosphate, um, the energy that's going to come from the breaking of this free phosphate off of that triphosphate molecule is going to drive the reaction whereby we pump out those three sodium molecules. Then, on the other side of the membrane, two potassium molecules come in. Those potassium molecules are going to come in and then the recom pump is then going to return to its original shape so that it, we can lather, rinse, repeat in terms of bringing in the sodium. So three sodium out, two potassium in, one ATP broken down so we can maintain these electrochemical gradients such that we can maintain water balance because water likes to follow sodium and again sugar balance because sodium is going to be, um, sorry, sodium is going to symport in glucose as well. So this is going to allow us to have a, a, a constant balance of water, salts, and sugars within our cells. Okay, so how does water and sodium work to affect your blood pressure? So if the body's going to hold on to too much fluid, your blood volume will increase, and that's going to increase your blood pressure, right? And remember, where sodium goes, water is going to follow. So if we have high concentrations of sodium, that means that we're going to end up with water coming across the membrane to those regions. Now we have specialty organs like the kidneys that help regulate our blood volume and also our electrolyte balance to help keep all of our water in homeostasis. And we have three main hormones and one main enzyme that are involved in the con controlling your blood volume. So things like antidiuretic hormone, it's also known as vasopressin or ADH. An antidiuretic hormone, remember I previously talked about diuretics, things like coffee and alcohol, things where you ingest them and you end up excreting more water than you consume. So you might consume a 20 ounce cup of coffee, but excrete more than that in your urine because that's a diuretic. Now an antidiuretic hormone is going to help us hold on to water. So we're going to help keep the water inside our body. We also have angiotensin and aldosterone. And the enzyme that I'm going to talk about is renin, but let's go ahead and take a look at how this all works together. So if we end up with a drop in our blood volume, so we end up with a low blood pressure because we have um, hypovolemic or low blood volume conditions, that's going to be detected by the hypothalamus because specialty receptors that are going to be responsible for detecting our blood pressure. And when the decrease in blood pressure drops, that's usually going to be associated with an increase in the concentration of salts, particularly if it's just happening through dehydration and not from something like hemorrhage. That's going to stimulate the thirst mechanism in the body. That means that the individual is going to want to intake fluids. By the time this thirst mechanism is stimulated, you've already lost about 1% of your body fluids. So by this point, you are already leaning towards the dehydration side. Um, so anytime that you feel thirsty, you want to indulge your body in giving it the water that it's, that it's telling you that it needs. Um, at this point, the, the thirst mechanism is going to also be associated with the stimulation of the release of ADH from the pituitary glands. And again, that comes by way of the hypothalamus. Hypothalamus is going to be regulating the pituitary. That's going to, again, release ADH. ADH is going to travel to the kidneys, where it stimulates the kidneys, ADH being an antidiuretic hormone, stimulates the kidneys to what? Resorb water, right? We're doing the opposite of a diuretic. We are holding onto and retaining our water. water. And that's going to help us decrease our urine output, which hopefully will allow our blood volume to increase so our osmolality returns to normal. And when we'll look a little bit later on, you can actually detect how well hydrated you are by looking at the color of your urine because if you are, if your body is allowing excess water to go through, you're probably fairly well hydrated. But if your body is undergoing this process of resorbing water and decreasing urine output, your urine is going to look very dark. If your blood pressure falls or your sodium concentration is reduced, right? Um, that means that we're going to have to signal another pathway that's going to help get our blood pressure back up, right? Um, so additionally, so in addition to this whole ADH pathway that's going to come out of the hypothalamus pituitary gland um, pathway, we're also going to have the secretion of renin by the kidneys. Um, now, there's a specialty protein that's called angiotensin 1. And I may have mentioned this previously, anytime you see inogen, it's a precursor. So angiotensinogen is a precursor for angiotensin. Um, and angiotensin 1 is found in the blood, but it's going to travel to the lungs where an enzyme called ACE, angiotensin-converting enzyme, um, is going to get 
allow it to be converted to angiotensin 2. So once angiotensin 1 travels from the blood supply into the lungs and gets converted to angiotensin 2, angiotensin 2 plays several roles in the body. One, it's a very powerful vessel constrictor, so it's going to tighten down the walls of the blood vessels such that we can constrict, therefore hopefully increasing our blood pressure. At the same time, the kidneys are going to be told to resorb water and salts, and the adrenal glands are going to release aldosterone. All right, so we talked about the pathway with the kidney, but we haven't talked about the aldosterone pathway yet. So the aldosterone pathway, I'm going to start here at the bottom, is responsible for signaling the kidneys to retain sodium. And remember, wherever sodium goes, water will follow, so this is going to indirectly lead to water retention. All right, so if we end up consuming too little sodium, um, that means that we're going to have an osmolality drop. What does that mean? That means that we're going to have a change in the osmotic pressure of our extracellular fluid, which means that the fluid is going to be shifting. So instead of the fluid being, having the pressure to go into the blood, now the fluid pressure um, of the osmotic pressure is going to be towards the interstitial fluid, which means that your blood volume and your blood pressure are going to decrease. Sometimes you're going to end up with edema as well or swelling in your tissues. Um, and angiotensin 2 is then going to trigger the release of aldosterone. So remember, aldosterone is responsible for sodium retention and also, therefore, indirect water retention. Okay, so this is a pathway of everything that I just kind of talked about. So if we have high concentrations of salt in the blood, that means that we probably are going to have low amounts of water in the blood. Usually that means we're entering into dehydration conditions. That means that we're going to want to get water into the bloodstream. So how do we do that? So the brain is going to have that specialty region called the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is responsible for detecting many things, but including the salt concentration in the blood. When we see that there's high concentration of salt, that's going to stimulate the pituitary gland here to release ADH. ADH travels to the kidney and results in water resorption, which is going to restore our blood volume and our blood pressure. Additionally, the kidneys have another pathway where when the kidneys sense it, a drop in your blood volume, they're going to secrete the enzyme renin. Renin is going to activate angiotensinogen to become angiotensin, right? So that's what renin does. Renin comes and activates angiotensinogen, becomes angiotensin 1. Angiotensin 1 travels to the lungs where ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme, turns it into angiotensin 2. Angiotensin 2 does a couple of things. It acts on the blood vessels as a vessel constrictor. Again, that should increase blood pressure, and it goes to the adrenal glands to stimulate the release of aldosterone, and aldosterone works on the kidneys to help resorb more sodium. So that's going to help increase our blood volume and our blood pressure. So we have two different pathways that are going to end up on the kidneys, the aldosterone pathway and the ADH pathway. ADH is direct for water resorption, um, and aldosterone is going to be working about working on the, um, the sodium retention, sodium resorption, which indirectly also leads to an increase in water resorption. Both of those are going to lead to an increase in blood volume and blood pressure. So how much water do we need to drink daily, and what are your best sources of water, right? Um, and water needs are going to be dependent on your physical activity, your environmental factors, and your diet. Recommendations include that you take approximately 80% of your water from your beverages and 20% from food, and then of course we also have those metabolic sources. And adult women need approximately 9 cups of additional fluid per day, and adult men approximately 13 cups of fluid per day. This varies, however, depending on your activity. So people who are very active are going to need to have higher water requirements than what I just spoke about. So how are you supposed to be getting that water? So you're supposed to be getting approximately 2 to 6 servings of water itself, and then a couple servings perhaps of unsweetened coffee or tea, so no sugar here. Two servings or so of milk or soy milk just to get in your calcium and protein. Um, this would be approximately 100 kilocalories. And then you want to try to avoid things like um, soft drinks and fruit drinks. And if you do want to drink these fruit drinks, you want to make sure it's actual fruit juices so you're getting the benefits of the fruit juice, including the vitamins, and instead of just having those um, fruit-flavored beverages, right? So this is the daily beverage recommendations for an adult individual in America. This is showing you the water content of different types of foods. As you can see, vegetables and fruits are going to be the highest concentration, dairy as well. Um, and things that are going to be high protein, like egg, uh, chicken, eggs, and fish, also are going to have some, um, some water in there as well. And if you're looking at your grains, everything except your cereal and your ready-to-eat dehydrated style um, grains is also going to have some water in as well. Things like cooked oatmeal, for example, that you've added the water to, pasta and rice that you've boiled in water. Um, breads and bagels are going to have some water in there as well. So really, you can get water from almost all of your food groups, um, the exception being you're not going to get much from that dehydrated cereal. 
All right, so how do we get water into our body? Well, we drink it, right? We drink it through tap water, bottled water, milk juices, etc. So make sure that you're trying to consume your liquids throughout the day so that you don't end up at the point where you're actually feeling thirsty because you've always kept up with your water needs. Remember, by the time you're feeling that thirst sensation, you've already lost 1% of your body weight in water. Now, most foods are also going to contribute to meeting your daily water needs. As I mentioned, unless you're eating astronaut food, you're going to be getting water from your diet as well. Things like fruits and vegetables are going to be a good bit more water by weight than things like dry grain. Um, very little water found in your dry grain products. But in, in your grain products like breads, you're still going to have some water, of course. Breads and muffins, etc., bagels. Now, caffeine, although it is a diuretic, is a very slight diuretic. It's not going to cause a significant loss of body water. It is a mild diuretic, again, mild diuretic, because what it does is it increases the amount of water that's excreted from the body. How does it do that? It does that by inhibiting ADH, um, and it works in the kidneys, obviously. Um, but caffeine doesn't cause a significant loss of body water over the course of the day compared to non-caffeinated compared to non-caffeinated beverages and you can become more tolerant to coffee over time so as you first start introducing something like caffeinated beverages like coffee or tea you might find yourself using the bathroom quite a lot but over time your to tolerance tends to um, develop typically it doesn't necessarily negatively affect your hydration status because the body is just going to upregulate the amount of ADH created so even though it's blocking the action to ADH, we're going to end up with more ADH and eventually resume normal function. Um, how does alcohol work as a diuretic? It also is going to inhibit um, anti-diuretic hormone, and it can induce urination very quickly, as quickly as 20 minutes after consumption, which leads to dehydration, obviously. It also is going to affect your electrolyte concentration, specifically your potassium concentration. So you want to try to take a banana if you're going to go on a, uh, an all-night bender. Um, Older adults are going to be less affected by this than younger drinkers. Um, younger drinkers, again, this tends to be like a tolerance thing. So eventually your body, if you are an established drinker, will just compensate by additional ADH. So even though we're inhibiting ADH, we increase more ADH, and eventually we end up with tolerance, basically. Um, but to prevent dehydration... There are two routes. First of all, you obviously want to reduce the amount of alcohol that you're consuming. And secondarily, you want to mix a glass of water in between every single alcoholic beverage. So drink a beer, drink a glass of water, drink a beer, drink a glass of water. Not only will this slow the amount of alcohol you're consuming down, but it will also help restore water balance in your body. All right. So hypertension, hyper, higher tension, blood pressure. So high blood pressure um, can Treated generally going to be treated by pharmaceutical diuretics, which are going to promote, again, diuresis or the increase of water loss by inhibiting the resorption of sodium. And if we have more sodium excreted, that means more fluid is going to excrete. Again, anywhere sodium goes, water tends to follow. That's going to help us reduce our blood volume and therefore lower our blood pressure. However, sometimes diuretics also increase potassium loss, um, which means that it's going to increase the risk of what's called hypokalemia or low potassium in your body and as I just mentioned previously alcohol also affects your potassium levels so oftentimes individuals who are taking these diuretic drugs are told not to drink for the purpose of maintaining their electrolyte balance particularly their potassium levels now the flip side of dehydration is water intoxication and in the old days in fraternity houses Hazing, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the process of hazing, but hazing is like ritualistic um, induction of people into a fraternity or sorority. And it used to include excessive alcohol drinking, which was obviously banned because it was bad for the individuals and for the fraternities and for the universities. So hazing with excessive alcohol was banned, and so then it was replaced for a short while by hazing, by drink, having them drink a gallon of water, um, which can result in water intoxication. It's generally going to be rare in individuals who have a balanced diet because it just means that we're going to be creating more urine. But if we drink it too quickly, like chugging that gallon of water in just one sitting without adequate sodium replenishment, depletes your sodium, which results in hyponatremia or really low sodium levels. It also increases the rate of urine production, but if we're not producing urine quickly enough, um, we can end up with really bad secondary results like brain swelling, which obviously can cause things like confusion and disorientation. Um, and because sodium balance is so important to your cells, this can be lethal and lead to death. So how did they come about that? Now they use gallons of milk or Gatorade or something like that that's going to result in fluid balance because it also has the electrolytes in there as well. 
Um, as I mentioned, dehydration is the flip side of that water intoxication coin, and it's caused by inadequate water intake, but can also be caused by excessive water loss, such as participating in exercise in the heat, or diarrhea, high fever, vomiting, or use of diuretic drugs. Um, as I mentioned, by the time you feel thirsty, you've lost 1%. As little as 2% loss of water can trigger loss of short-term memory and long-term memory, lower attention span, lower cognition, ability, inability to maintain your core temperatures, increased risk of infections and fatigue. So make sure that when you feel thirsty, you drink water so that you don't get to the point that you're so dehydrated that you're experiencing these conditions. Because the consequences of dehydration can be very severe, particularly for individuals who are very young, or very old, and athletes. It's particularly of consequence to the elderly because elderly people tend to suffer from dementia more than younger adults, and oftentimes because it can cause lower attention span, right, loss of short-term memory. Um, dehydration is oftentimes misdiagnosed as early, on, early dementia and not treated, whereas it's very simple, just give them an extra glass of water. And in athletes, this can cause severe um, impairment of their performance. Now, what does this look like? So some of the signs of dehydration. The very first sign of moderate dehydration is going to be thirst, right? Um, mild to moderate dehydration, dry lips and thirst. The mouth is going to feel a little bit dry. Lower urine output, so you're going to end up with concentrated urine. It's going to appear very dark yellow instead of nice and light and yellow. Um, in moderate dehydration, you can get dry mouth extreme. Um, your sunken eyes, because your tissue is starting to retract a little bit, so your eyes can have a sunken appearance. Um, on infants, this can appear as sunken fontanelles, or the small spots on an infant's head. That can be an indicator that your infant is not getting enough liquid in their diet. Um, additionally, something called tenting can occur. So if you pinch the back of the, of the skin on the back of your hand, when you let go, it returns to normal. If you're severely dehydrated, it will not bounce back readily and will remain in that pinched shape. That's called tenting. Um, and that's a sign of moderate dehydration. And severe dehydration is going to include all of those signs, but it's going to get to the point where we are um, verge of death, right? Lethargic and comatose. Our lips are going to be blue because we're not going to get adequate circulation because our blood is very thick. We're going to have rapid breathing and a rapid pulse that's very weak. So again, abnormal circulation is going to lead to temperature issues like cold hands and cold feet. So as I mentioned previously, the very first physical sign of dehydration is typically thirst, the feeling of being thirsty. And at this point, you've already lost 1%. Now, when water is lost from the body, this results in reduced blood volume, reduced blood pressure, and hypotension if severe enough, hypotension being low blood pressure. Now, low blood pressure means that we can have reduced cardiac output and impaired digestion. It can also lead to fainting or blackout because we have inadequate um, oxygen distribution to the tissues. And during the process of dehydration, water is depleted from all of the body sources. It's depleted from the extracellular fluids and the intracellular fluids. So that means it's depleted from the bloodstream. It's depleted from the extracellular fluid. Like the, um, the, It's also going to be depleted from the cytoplasm. So all of the parts of the body are going to be suffering because we need water for all the parts of metabolism. Okay, so this is going to be the thirst mechanism. Basically, we're going to have an increase in osmolarity, which occurs because we have thicker blood, right? Um, means that we are going to have low, um, low amounts of water. We're also going to have lower amounts of saliva leading to dry mouth. This is going to stimulate the, hypo um, the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus and the dry mouth together are going to stimulate the th thirst center. An additional mechanism to stimulate that thirst, th thirst center is by having a drop in blood volume. That's known as hypovolemia. If you think of hypovolemic shock, for example, it's because we have low blood volume due to hemorrhage. Um, but you can have low blo blood volume due to lack of water as well, which leads to low blood pressure. These are all going to stimulate that thirst center and make you drink fluid. Hopefully, if you drink enough fluid, that water being absorbed is going to decrease your osmolality until you no longer feel thirsty and you've restored fluid balance. So how do you make sure that you avoid being over or dehydrated, especially if you're going to be undergoing extreme physical activity? So you're going to want to monitor your water intake. And you're going to want to measure your body weight before and after long bouts of vigorous activity and then determine how much water has been lost. For every pound that you have lost, you want to consume 16 fluid ounces of water if you're going to assume that all of the weight loss is due to the loss of body water. And if you note that you have gained weight after the excessive exercise, then probably you're overhydrated to begin with and you should be consuming less fluids before your next activity. 
And this last slide is going to show you how you're able to evaluate your hydration levels based on your urine color. And these are just different levels of hydration. You want to aim between one and two. Um, so you want to aim to be that it's so clear it's almost looks like water. Between three and four is still healthy, however, you're going to still be bright yellow. As you start getting into these darkening, especially into the seven and eights, you're reaching dehydrated and extreme dehydrated conditions. And this is where you can be at risk of a um, urinary tract infection. Oftentimes it's also already going to be cloudy if you have a urinary tract infection. Um, and this is why when they do your analysis, they're going to take a look at several different things in this water, not just the color and the clarity, but also they're going to look at the bacterial count or if there's any blood in there and there oughtn't be, if there's any um, protein in there, which indicates you might have an abnormal diet. So they'll do a lot of things when they're looking at the urinalysis, including salt concentrations and pH balance. All right, everyone, so I'm going to leave you there. I appreciate you coming to my lecture today, and I will see you next time. Have a great day and happy studying. Aloha.